Good evening. Uh, my name is John Conley. I'm the director of the Institute for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, uh, which is co-sponsoring uh, this talk. Our guest tonight is Professor Omar Bartov. He is the John P. Berklin Distinguished Professor of European History uh, and Professor of German Studies at Brown University. Professor Bartov was born in Israel. He attended Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv University and St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He's most noted uh, among historians, I think, for his studies of the German army in World War II, in particular the way that he challenged the popular view that the German army was an apolitical force that had little involvement in war crimes or crimes against humanity. Uh, Professor Bartov has argued that the Wehrmacht was a deeply Nazi institution that played a key role in the Holocaust and the occupied areas of the Soviet Union. In fact, I, can think, I think it's not too, uh, too much to say that he inaugurated a whole school of research on uh, the German army and um, its operations in the East. Uh, from 1989 to 1992, he was a junior Harvard Fellow, and he's also been a Guggenheim Fellow, has had many other honors. Uh, he is considered one of the world's leading authorities on the subject of genocide. Uh, the foreword has called him one of the foremost scholars of Jewish life in Galicia. If I can uh, indulge in some personal uh, comments, uh, Professor Bartov, in my experience, also has the unusual gift of bringing scholars together. Dozens, scores, and I discovered hundreds of scholars sometimes, and, joint projects, not just to schmooze and conference, but actually to collaborate, to learn from each other, and to produce some pretty important works. Um, if you've read Professor Bartov's work, his essays that have appeared in the New Republic and other places, his books, you may have noticed a particular elegance in formulation. I was um, in our library this afternoon looking for one of those collected volumes of scholars that he's brought together, and I discovered while looking at our own website at the um, I guess it's called, uh, that, uh, among Professor Bartov's writings, the two earliest ones, or among the two earliest, are in Hebrew, and they are novels. I'd heard a uh, rumor of this at one point, but I saw it confirmed in our own catalog. I don't know what these are about. Um, the interesting thing is, according to the CV, these novels were written at some point between Oxford and other places, and not somewhere in Western and Central Europe. Um, I want to note that among uh, Professor Bartov's uh, reputations as a scholar, I've mentioned already that he's a historian of Europe, historian of, of Germany, and I think he's also considered to be a foremost historian of the Holocaust. Um, it's a huge field, as you're no doubt aware. I think what stands out in Professor Bartov's work is that it is, it is consistently edifying, uh, and that no matter how much you know or thought you know, you learn something different and new. His talk tonight uh, is about his most recent book, uh, Anatomy of the Genocide, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach. So please welcome Professor Bartov to Berkeley. Well, thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. Uh, the novels were written in Israel, actually, uh, in 88 and 89. Um, just before I came to this country. Um, um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I will try uh, this afternoon to uh, present to you a book that I've been working on in many ways for the last 20 years um, with a few distractions and uh, other writings uh, and consistently for the last uh, 10 years. Um, I started uh, working on this book in the, or thinking about this book in the uh, 1990s. Um, at the time you may know, thank you, at the time you may know uh, several important events occurred. Um, first of all, the communist system uh, collapsed. Um, and secondly, um, because of this collapse, there was this idea that now we were facing a new time, uh, and some, some people um, prophesied that um, this was the end of history. Um, history rejected that notion, however, and <laughs> continued uh, moving on, and the first thing that he produced shortly thereafter 
with two genocides. Uh, one which began in 1992 in Bosnia, in the former Yugoslavia, um, and produced possibly as many as uh, a quarter of a million um, victims. And the second in 1994, uh, in which 800,000 people were killed in the fastest genocide in history within 10 weeks, mostly by machete and fire. Uh, the 1990s also were a time in which the Holocaust uh, came into the fore as an important event in the 20th century. We tend to forget that in the 1960s, 70s, uh, the Holocaust was not considered to be an important event and in fact was missing from most histories of World War II and quite a few histories of Germany and even the Third Reich. Uh, but by the 1980s, uh, there was a growing recognition and growing scholarship of the Holocaust. And by the 1990s, it became, uh, it came to be seen uh, not simply as an important event, but as one that the new uh, states that uh, were released of uh, Soviet uh, rule and wanted to uh, join the EU uh, had to recognize as part of their own uh, complex past. Um, now, for me, uh, this period was one in which I began thinking about the relationship between those genocides that were occurring uh, in the 1990s, uh, which, was very, which were very intimate genocides in which often neighbors were killing neighbors, and our understanding at the time that I shared uh, that the Holocaust was, uh, um, could be characterized as having two major elements. One was uh, the dehumanization of uh, people before you kill them. That is that in order to uh, produce a continent-wide uh, genocide, um, it was important to create an image of uh, the, the prospective victims uh, as different from uh, the rest of humanity, or at least from that part of humanity with which we, in that case Germans, had a sense of solidarity. And the second was to create a mechanism uh, that would distance, or distance, create distance between um, the perpetrators um, and the victims. And that um, distance would be created by a compartmentalization of the process of killing. Uh, so if we want to imagine this, we can say that um, Jews living in a place like uh, Grunewald in Berlin uh, one day um, called to assemble and they marched down the street, they're, they're wearing coats, they carry their little suitcases, their neighbors are looking at them through their windows, uh, they go to the train station, they get on the train and they disappear. They go nach Osten, they go to the east. Um, by the time they get to the east, uh, they no longer look like the good citizens that they had looked like when they got on the train and then through a process um, often very quick if they are going directly to an extermination camp they, they are short of their hair, they're stripped of their clothes, they run through uh, barbed wire, they're pushed into gas chambers and within two hours they're turned into ashes and no one uh, by then knows who they are and no one, not one, a, a particular individual is responsible or can see the entire process. Now this explanation of how you create modern genocide, of course, was true. And the Germans did try to create such a system. Um, but thinking about what was happening in the 1990s, um, I started thinking about the Holocaust too through that prison. <coughs> of those kind of much more intimate uh, killings in which neighbors encounter neighbors. And I thought that it might be uh, important to think, uh, is there or was there in fact a personal encounter between the killers and the victims? And if there was, was there a, re a recognition of the other group's humanity? And if that is the case, how are we to understand it? How can we research that? Now, it so happens, and it was not an accident, uh, 
that in thinking about that, I began thinking of where would I um, and how would I understand this process. Uh, in some ways it took me back to my early years as a, uh, as a PhD student when I did the study of the, of the German army. No one could study the entire German army. There were about 20 million people who went through the German armed forces and so I chose at the time three army divisions and studied them very closely through com three combat divisions to see whether the cliches that were um, uh, popular at the time were true. And so I thought that perhaps the best way to study this potential encounter between the victims and the perpetrators would be to look at one town, what happened in one place. Uh, that place had to be a place in Eastern Europe, because in Eastern Europe uh, most of the Jews lived and most of the Jews were murdered. Um, and the question was which, which place to choose. Um, and as I thought about it, um, I started thinking about the town of Buchach. Now, I suspect that most of you have not heard about the town of Buchach, uh, but I grew up in Israel, and at the time at least, when I was in high school, I don't think that is the case any longer, uh, uh, a well-known writer called Shmuel Yosef Agnon uh, was uh, on the curriculum. Uh, so we all read Agnon. Agnon uh, was the uh, Nobel Prize uh, winner of 1966 uh, in literature, the only author writing in the Hebrew language to have received the Nobel Prize, and he came from Buchach. He not only came from Buchach, but although he left it when he was 21 years old, uh, much of his writing was about Buchach. He didn't always call it Buchach, he, he gave it different names, and Buchach did not represent just the town for him, but represented the entirety of Eastern European Jewry. That even when he left before World War I, he thought was in a process of decline, had declined much more after World War I, and uh, when he was writing his final book about Buchach, a kind of biography of Buchach in the years after World War II, had of course uh, entirely uh, vanished, uh, had been murdered. And so I thought, uh, why not Buchach? Uh, once I thought about it, uh, I realized that some other important uh, figures uh, of the 20th century related to the Holocaust uh, came from that town. One of them, of course, is Immanuel Ringenblum, uh, who was a major figure in uh, young historian in the interwar period, uh, writing on Polish-Jewish relations and had established the Onyx Shabbat or Onyx Shabbos archive of the Warsaw Ghetto during the war, uh, thanks to which we actually uh, could reconstruct the history of what happened in that camp. Uh, he himself, uh, along with his son, was denounced and murdered in 1944. And Simon Wiesenthal, the so-called uh, Nazi hunter, also came from Buchach. And when I went to his apartment, uh, his archive in Vienna, which was a two-bedroom apartment, um, I found that he had a very large dossier uh, um, marked Buchach. Uh, and that dossier, or, or this big folder, uh, had to do with his uh, appeals to survivors of the town to testify in trials of former perpetrators, mostly in Germany. And he asked them to come and testify. He was focused, of course, on those who murdered his family and his community. But another person who came from Buchach was my mother. And I thought that if I wanted to uh, do an intimate study of a town and to actually understand the voices of the people who lived in that town, uh, there was some uh, sense in um, my own having a, or having a personal connection to that town. Um, my mother was born in uh, 1924 and lived in Buchach until 1935 uh, when she and her parents and her two brothers uh, went to Palestine. Uh, none of the rest of my family, and it was like all families at the time, an extended family, uh, came out uh, of uh, that area. And although I know a great deal now, after all those years of research, how the Jewish community there was murdered, I don't know specifically how members of my family, 
were killed. I can only guess. Um, so in 1995, I decided to interview my mother uh, about her childhood. And it was an interesting experience because it was, as I understood, it was the first time that I actually asked her about her childhood. I was by then 41 years old. She was 71 years old. I asked her, tell me about your childhood. And she talked for an hour and a half, more or less nonstop. I didn't have to follow up with any questions. I turned on the tape recorder. And she talked that what was important to me in what she was saying was that she did not talk about her town as a place of fear, of hatred, of anti-Semitism, of persecution. She talked about it. She had fond memories. Uh, she spoke uh, Yiddish at home. Uh, she went to a Polish school uh, because it was a public school. There was a Hebrew school, but you had to pay tuition. So she went to the public school. Uh, and on the street, she spoke Ukrainian. Uh, her girlfriends were Ukrainian, and they would go to the forest and pick mushrooms and berries. Uh, of course, she left before all of that happened. Uh, but subsequently, thinking about that conversation, I realized that my first question which was about the encounter between the victims and the perpetrators was insufficient because there were not only uh, perpetrators and victims in that encounter. There was everybody else. Uh, and in that town, there were Poles and Ukrainians as well as Jews. And I understood that one has to, 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 to grasp the relationship between those groups in order to understand what happens when the perpetrators march in. So this was the, 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 the initial framework that I had, the initial questions uh, that I had when I set out on this trip. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Buchach, not, not, not a huge amount because I want to get to some of the other materials, but I think it's important to understand the historical context of this. Uh, Buchach was one of uh, many uh, borderland towns um, created in the, in the, in the late uh, Middle Ages. Uh, it was on the southern borderlands of a vast uh, empire. Uh, few people now remember it, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, and it was supposed to be one of a chain of towns that would protect uh, that entity from invasions from the east by uh, Tatars and Cossacks and from the south by the Ottomans. Uh, Poland, as you know probably, uh, disappeared from the map in the late 18th century. It was partitioned between the surrounding empires. And the uh, southern part of, Pol of Poland uh, was torn off by the Habsburg Empire and given the name Galicia, um, which was invented uh, for dynastic reasons to justify this annexation. And Buchat found itself now in Galicia, in the eastern part of Galicia, and in the eastern part of Eastern Galicia. So very much in the east, uh, close to the Russian border, uh, later on the Soviet border. Uh, this uh, Habsburg Empire, later the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was a vast empire with numerous uh, ethnic groups and religions. Uh, its easternmost province then became Galicia, and it was also the poorest province. It also was uh, the province with the largest concentration of Jews in the empire. Uh, and the eastern part of Galicia had a majority Ukrainian, they would call them Ruthenian population, uh, a very large Polish minority, and a large Jewish minority, which constituted about 10% of the population. Now that empire also went the way of empires, and at the end of World War I, uh, it disappeared. And that part of it was re replaced by a resurrected Poland. And the eastern part of Poland uh, was majority non-Polish. Interwar Poland was only 60% ethnic Polish, which was more or less equivalent to Roman Catholic. Its eastern part uh, had a majority of Ukrainians who were Greek, Catholic, and Jews. Now, it's, it's important to understand that in those uh, um, uh, territories, there was, for centuries, a mixed population of Poles, Jews, and Ukrainians, although the Ukrainians were not called that until much later. Uh, 
these people lived side by side. Uh, they did not know any other existence but living side by side. They had their own sense of their religion, of their ethnicity. They told each other different stories uh, about who they were and who the other group was. Uh, but these were not necessarily uh, stories of animosity and conflict. At the same time, this was not what we would uh, recognize as a pluralistic uh, or multicultural society. Uh, people had pretty clear ideas of who they were vis-a-vis -vis the other groups. Uh, the question is, when and why did this coexistence, this particular type of coexistence, which goes back at least to the 16th century, uh, turn into something else? When did these groups start uh, finding reasons for uh, animosity between them? Now, I would say that uh, clearly one can uh, identify some of this violence as having to do with outside invaders. Uh, so World War I was definitely an important moment. But it begins before that. It begins with nationalist narratives that appear in this area in the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, and to um, speak about it very briefly, uh, the way that Poles in uh, Eastern Galicia uh, presented themselves to themselves and to others was that they had come to those wild areas to civilize them. They had built cities, um, they, 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 they brought their own culture, and they were um, uh, pacifying um, the ignorant uh, serfs and peasants of that area, the Ruthenians. The Ukrainian national uh, narrative uh, was exactly the opposite. It was that the Ukrainians in that area were the indigenous population, which had been colonized by the Poles, who were colonizing it together with the assistance of their Jewish lackeys, those who ran their uh, distilleries for them, who ran the estates for them, who were leasing all these estates uh, for the Polish nobility. Uh, the, the Jewish view of, of that world was somewhat different. Uh, Jews did not lay claim to territory there. Um, they certainly spoke about themselves as having developed commerce, of having played an important role in trade. Uh, but unlike the Polish and Ukrainian narrative, which by the late 19th century are about ownership of the land, who should have the land and who should not, who belongs and who doesn't, the Jews don't claim, don't lay any claims on the land itself. Uh, in many ways, it's a population that sees itself as transitory. Uh, Agnon told the uh, uh, a moving story about this. He tells the story twice, uh, once as a young man about the origins of East European Jewry and once as a much older man about the origins of the foundation of the city of Buczaj. But it's the same story, which means that Buczaj for him was Eastern Europe. Uh, the story was that uh, a, a group of Jews in Ashkenaz, in, in, in medieval Germany, uh, decided that they wanted to go to Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel. Uh, and they appealed to their Lord to release them and let them go. And he agreed. So they packed their things and they started going to the land of Israel. But they didn't know where it was. All they knew was that it was in the east. And so they marched east. And as they were marching, the, the population be became less dense, the forest be became much greater. And by the time of the high holidays, they found themselves in large forests the snow was coming down, and they had to stop to celebrate the high holidays. And as they were stopping, they were surrounded by men who looked like bears, who were wearing uh, heavy furs, and who told them, look, you will freeze here. Why don't we take you in and protect you over winter, and then when spring comes, you can continue on your journey. They said, fine. And by the end of winter, the lords, who were these Polish lords, uh, said, well, it's not so bad having these Jews around. They've developed commerce, they've developed trade, maybe we should sort of keep them. And the Jews said, 
well, now our pregnant women are even more pregnant, our old men are even older, maybe we should stay here for a little bit. And so they stayed overnight. And that night lasted 400 years. Uh, and the, the term that he's playing with, I don't know, is Pauline. In the Hebrew, Pauline is, we, we should stay overnight. Um, so Poland is Pauline. Uh, now, th this was a story to try to explain the mentality of that population of East European Jewry, uh, but it, what it captures is a certain sense of being transitory, of not being of the place. Uh, now, that does not mean that in the politics of the period before World War I, uh, people don't identify themselves politically, uh, such as in um, uh, this image of uh, the uh, uh, election campaign of 1907, the only truly democratic election campaign in the Austrian Empire in that region. Uh, and people organized th themselves politically according to their ethnic groups. Uh, there were coalitions at the time between Jewish parties uh, and Ukrainian parties uh, against the dominant uh, Polish forces. Uh, but all of this, which was, as I said, the, the, the narratives, the stories people told became more and more aggressive. If there was one thing that, that uh, Poles and Ukrainians agreed on, it was that in their future vision of what their own national state would look like, there was no place for the Jews. Uh, it, it was not part of how you imagined the future. But there was not much violence. In fact, uh, the Western view of these areas being very violent is distorted. Between 1700 and 1914, these areas saw very little violence. But World War I changed all of that. World War I was extremely violent in these areas, not only because of the uh, terrible uh, battles that uh, took place there, uh, with, with tens of thousands of people killed, if you only look at the area of Buchach, of the Strepa Valley, the, the river that runs there, uh, but also because there was extreme violence against civilian populations. And among the civilian po populations most uh, obviously targeted were the Jews who were targeted by the Russian army, which occupied Buchach twice in 1914-15, and then again in 1916, uh, including several uh, pogroms, rather well-documented pogroms. Uh, I was lucky to uh, find a diary by a, a Polish headmaster uh, who uh, described Buchach under Russian occupation during World War I. There aren't that many uh, such documents, and one uh, can see the violence there. And, and this man was pretty anti-Semitic. And a, and a proud Polish nationalist, but he describes in some detail uh, the, the violence by the Russian occupiers against the Jewish population. Um, so the war is extremely destructive and extremely violence, violent, but it does not end in 1918. In 1918, with the collapse of the Austrian Empire, begins a war between the Poles and the Ukrainians over that land. Uh, and it's interesting to understand that even during the war, uh, many Poles, certainly in this area, are saying they're not fighting for the empire, although they are wearing its uniforms, they're fighting for the creation of an independent Poland. And many of the Ukrainians who are fighting in the uniforms of the Austrian, Austrian Hungarian army are fighting to create an independent Western Ukraine. And now when the empire collapses, they, they do fight over that land. And that fighting is extremely brutal, with many, many massacres between the populations, which both groups then propagate to the international community to win favor and to say the other group are savages and we uh, should have our land. There are also quite a number of pogroms against Jewish populations during that same time. By the time Poland establishes itself as, a, uh, uh, as the ruling power uh, in 1921, which is uh, formally recognized in 1923, um, um, it, the, the, the years of violence, uh, many years of violence in that area, and especially the inter-ethnic conflict, uh, create seething uh, rage within the occupied or ruled population. The Ukrainians have not succeeded in creating their own independent republic, uh, 
And the Poles are, are very keen, the Polish government is very keen to keep down uh, any uh, nationalist sentiment uh, among the Ukrainian population. Uh, that means that whenever there are such attempts uh, by Ukrainians, uh, then they're clamped down on or, uh, in operations of pacification uh, by the Polish authorities, both by the uh, military and by the police. Um, there's also an attempt to colonize that area uh, by Poles, bringing Polish peasants from uh, the heartland of Poland into these eastern parts. The obvious result is that this brings about the creation of an underground, the Ukrainian underground, uh, the most important of which is the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, which comes under the influence of other fascist organizations in the area, in, the, in Europe and later on also is trained and provided for by Nazi Germany after Hitler comes to power in 1933, and which is dedicated to creating a Jew-free and Pole-free Ukraine. Um, and is preparing for the moment at which it could take over. Uh, the Jewish po population in that area uh, fears increasingly towards Zionism. By the 1930s, the, la the most powerful party in Buchach and in many other uh, towns in that area uh, is Zionist. A small groups of uh, young men and women uh, immigrate to Palestine, but by 1935 it's very difficult for Jews to leave that area. Uh, Palestine, um, after 1936, the Arab Rebellion becomes very difficult to go to. The authorities do not issue immigration certificates. And as you know, the United States uh, is not uh, too happy to receive immigrants either from Asia or from Eastern Europe uh, and passes laws against that. And there is the Great Depression. Uh, some uh, Jews uh, at that point turn to communism. Uh, the, the communist cell of Buchach is Jewish. Uh, it's made up of 20 to 30 men and women. Uh, it's uh, uh, totally ineffective, uh, and the only it cannot gain uh, the favor of the masses because the masses there are Ukrainian, the masses of the peasants, uh, and its only claim to fame, I would say, is that some of its members later on uh, create a Jewish underground uh, during uh, German rule, and uh, almost all of them are killed uh, uh, in that process. Now, the last moment that we really have to understand uh, in, as, as we move into the period of the Holocaust is that in 1939, uh, this area is taken over by the Soviet Union. This is part of the pact between Hitler and Stalin of, uh, that actually facilitates the, the, the beginning of World War II, that uh, Eastern Europe would be divided between the two. Uh, Soviet rule, uh, in, in that area uh, is very brutal. Uh, the Soviets, first of all, um, destroy much of the not very successful economy of the area um, quite quickly, and they begin um, uh, deporting uh, those they perceive as their uh, political and social enemies. There are waves of deportation, first of Poles, of the Polish aristocracy, um, of Polish political activists, of uh, former uh, officers in the Polish army and so forth. Then they turn to deport Jews. They deport Jews both as social uh, enemies and as political activists, Zionists. And in the last phase, they turn against the Ukrainians who had initially welcomed the Soviet uh, occupation because they saw it as liberation from Polish rule, but by uh, uh, a few months later realized that this is not much of a liberation uh, and the Soviets uh, incarcerate thousands of Ukrainian activists um, in jails. So that when the German army invades this area uh, in late June 1941, uh, the NKVD gets orders to either take those political prisoners uh, along with it or to shoot them and they usually choose the easier uh, option of shooting them right there. And as immediately after shooting those thousands of uh, Ukrainian activists in local jails, uh, as they move out, uh, 
um, local Ukrainians, um, uh, particularly political activists, uh, start massacring Jews in those areas with the argument that the Jews have collaborated with the Soviets in uh, putting down Ukrainian nationalism. And so by the time the Germans move in, there is already, there have been two ways of killing, which the Germans, of course, encourage, uh, at least for a while. Uh, and tens of thousands of people are killed, both Ukrainian nationalists and immediately thereafter, uh, Jewish po populations in many towns. This is followed by the creation of militias. Uh, so in a town like Buchach and its area, a militia of about a hundred Ukrainian activists is formed. Its leaders are men who were active in the underground in the 1930s, in the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. They are armed and they start um, um, uh, arresting and killing uh, those who had cooperated with the Soviets during those two years, as well as other uh, enemies they can identify, quite a number of them being Ukrainians who had worked with the Soviets and are seen as enemies. Um, the entry of the Germans into this area is celebrated. Again, there is an expectation that perhaps now the Germans would allow for the creation of uh, uh, an independent Ukraine which the Germans have no intention of uh, doing. Uh, and so there are these popular celebrations of men and women uh, marching in the streets, uh, as you can see under uh, um, the Nazi flags of the new occupiers. Uh, this cooperation between the local Ukrainian population and the Germans continues throughout much of uh, the German occupation. Uh, in 1943, the Germans recruit an entire Waffen SS division in that area, including in uh, the town of Buchach. Uh, that division is shortly thereafter destroyed by the Red Army and its remnants join the Ukrainian insurgent army that keeps fighting the Soviets uh, after World War II. <coughs> but the Germans in that area are, um, are not much interested in uh, Ukrainian uh, independence. Uh, the goal of the German security forces there uh, is to exterminate the Jews. Um, Eastern Galicia, or as they call it, District Galician, is annexed to the general government, uh, which is the, the uh, part of Poland that was not directly annexed by Germany. And the SS uh, creates a series of outposts, of security police outposts throughout that region. One of these outposts is established in the city of Chortkov, or Chortkiv now, uh, which is close to Buchach, and that outpost is responsible both for uh, Chortkov and for Buchach. Um, there are about 20 to 30 men in that outpost. Uh, some are German and some are ethnic German, from Lithuania, from Czechoslovakia, from Poland. These 20 to 30 men, um, between August of 1941 and early 1944, but particularly between late summer 1942 and early summer 1943, killed an estimated 60,000 Jews in that region, uh, of which 10,000 are killed in Buchach. Uh, the killing is very much according to the model that applies to all of Galicia. Uh, in Galicia at the time, there were, or in district Galicia, in Galicia, there were just over half a million Jews. About half of them are deported to the extermination camp of Berzhet, uh, which is on the Polish-Ukrainian border. Um, the second half are killed right where they live. They're killed in the synagogues, they're killed in the cemeteries, they're killed on the street, they're killed in nearby creeks and hills. Uh, and they're still there, the mass graves are still there. Um, even those who are eventually deported to extermination camps are first under German rule uh, for a, about a year uh, in all these small towns. Most of the deportations to the camps uh, begin in August, September 1942, so a, month, a year after the Germans actually move in.
the Germans have uh, close relationships with the populations. They're very thin on the ground, as you can see. So first of all, uh, in order to accomplish this, they, they uh, transform the militias that were organized by Ukrainian nationalists into auxiliary police forces. So these 20 to 30 Germans in Chotkov, in that one town, have a battalion of about 350 auxiliary, Ukrainian auxiliary policemen, many of whom were in original militias, and others are recruited in the area. Secondly, they have local police forces in each town. They have regular uniform German policemen, most of them older, men in the 30s or 40s with children at home. They have a local Ukrainian policemen in each town. And those towns that have uh, Jewish councils, such as Buchach, uh, also form Jewish police, police forces, or Ordnungsdienst. Um, and it is with the cooperation of all these forces that then when they begin the Aktionen, the Aktie, the, the, the roundups, uh, these other forces round up parts of these populations and lead them either to the local train station to be deported to the extermination camps or to a nearby forest or cemetery to be shot. But when the Germans are not doing that, they're having an extremely good time. And one has to, to read the accounts to understand that. Uh, they're there uh, without any threat and without any control. No one actually knows what they're doing. They're very good at doing the killing. They're very effective in that. But the rest of the time, they have unlimited supplies of alcohol, unlimited supplies of food, unlimited supplies of tobacco. There's actually a tobacco factory right nearby. Uh, and a limited supply of sex as much as they would like. Uh, they run brothels there and so forth. Uh, life is so uh, comfortable in that bucolic area, uh, and it is a very beautiful area, that they bring their wives, they bring their children, they bring their parents, they have mistresses. And when you read accounts later on, particularly by women who were uh, the wives of administrators, not, not only of the killers, but also of local German ad ad administrators, uh, they talk about how they tried to create a normal life in this small island which is floating over an ocean of blood. They also have very close relations with the Jews. The Jews act as their babysitters, as their maids, as their dentists, um, as their tailors. They come in and out of their houses. They know each other by name. In these accounts, many names come up. So, um, this is not uh, an event in which there is any um, um, dehumanization in the sense of not knowing those people. Uh, for instance, Jew Jewish maids are important for German housewives to take them to the market because they don't speak the local language. They go to the dairies for them. And they leave the children at their care when they want to uh, go and have a ball someplace. There's obviously also a strong relationship between the Germans and the other local population, particularly with uh, Ukrainians because there is constant cooperation between the two groups. So that when the killing begins, the killing is uh, of people that they have already gotten to know. Now, another aspect of this that is uh, often not understood, we tend to think, and rightly so because of the literature that we have on this, we tend to think of the killing as being secret, of the killing as being elsewhere. Just as I said, the Jews were put on a train and disappeared. Now the people in Paris or in Berlin or in Amsterdam, for them this is true, but for people living in a place like Buchach it is not. These roundups meant that people were dragged through the streets, hundreds of them were killed right under your window, and the rest of them were killed in very nearby sites. If you look at this map, this is an aerial photo by the uh, Luftwaffe from uh, April 1944. You can see the town is here. It's mostly on this side of the river. That's the Strepa, the river. Most of the town is here, a little bit is here. 
This is where the Jewish cemetery is, and this is the Fedor, Fedir Hill, uh, which used to be a place that people would go to on the Sabbath or on Sunday uh, with their children to picnic. Uh, these are the two main sites of the killing. Uh, this area and this area. They're one within sight of the other, and both can be seen from the center of town. Each of them is about 10-15 minute walk from the center of town. So that when these roundups happen, and I estimate that uh, up to um, two-thirds of uh, those uh, of the population, the Jewish population killed there, uh, were, were killed in, in the town rather than deported, uh, when this happened, everything was entirely public. You could hear and see everything. And in fact, there are many accounts of people who were curious, local residents who were curious to see what did it actually look like and would climb on trees or sneak in to see what this killing actually uh, would, would look like. So, uh, this process continues mostly between um, in Buchac between October uh, 1942 and June 1943, at which point Galicia as a whole is declared uh, Judenfrei. That doesn't mean that all the Jews are gone. Uh, there are still Jews working in labor camps, increasingly in agricultural labor camps in the area, and there are Jews in hiding. Uh, in fact, what is uh, particular for the case of Buchac is that in March 19. Uh, 44, uh, Buchach is taken by the Red Army, and about 800 Jews come out of shelter, uh, which is a high number. Um, now, it's high in comparison with others. Uh, there were about 8,000 Jews there in 1939, uh, but it's considered to be quite high in comparison to other towns, and there are various questions as to why. But two weeks later, as you saw from this aerial photograph, the German army recaptures the town. Uh, and it's, a, it's an SS division that takes over that town. And 700 out of those 800 Jews are killed. Uh, the Red Army retreating is not interested in helping the Jews out. These people who came out of shelter can hardly walk. Uh, and the shelters, and now no, have been exposed. So most of them are killed. Now, this is not the end of the violence in that area. The violence now shifts largely to violence between Ukrainians and Poles. The ethnic cleansing of the Poles, uh, led by the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and now a newly established uh, Ukrainian insurgent army, begins in a nearby province in Volhynia, to the northeast of Galicia, and then in early 1944 starts going into Galicia. Um, and that is an extremely brutal uh, conflict. Uh, this is not to say that Poles are also not participating in massacring uh, civilian populations of Ukrainians, uh, but the ratio is such that the Ukrainians kill far more Poles, and Poles are beginning to flee from that area into central Poland. Curiously enough, they are often helped by the Germans to get out of there. The Germans, unlike the case of the Jews, which is their agenda, are not particularly interested in this conflict between the Ukrainians and the Poles as long as it doesn't hamper their own activities. But by the time the Red Army finally arrives, which is in July of 1944 in Buchach, uh, uh, the majority of the Polish population has fled. The rest of it is later deported by the Soviets in a population exchange agreement with uh, communist uh, Poland. Now what the population in uh, uh, Buchach and the area, uh, which it be becomes uh, homogeneously Ukrainian, what it remembers is those last uh, months of the war, the, the uh, conflict with the Poles, and then the fighting against the Soviets. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, Ukrainian nationalists keep fighting the Soviets after they come. They don't see this as liberation, they see this as reoccupation. Uh, and the Soviets, and especially the NKVD, use uh, the well and tried um, um, uh, system of putting down such insurrections, and they deport 
uh, large numbers of people to Central Asia and to gulags. Uh, so this is very much the memory of the population in the area. What people tend to forget is such people uh, as uh, Volodymyr Kaznovsky, who was the district attorney uh, in that area before the war, became the chief of police of Buchach during the war, and had a long list of uh, crimes to his name uh, in cooperating with the Germans. The Soviets did uh, research what happened there just as they arrived, uh, particularly in October, November 1944. They drew a sketch of the mass grave, they, they exhumed bodies, they estimated the number of people killed, uh, and they wrote a report, although the report, even during those months, shifts from uh, being about Jewish victims and local collaborators to being about innocent Soviet citizens and uh, some bad apples among the population. So by the time the final report is done, it looks much more like the, uh, what has become, what becomes a conventional Soviet narrative. But the Soviets are not interested in leaving any signs later on that would show the specificity of the killing of the Jews. Uh, this photograph, which is of the survivors in Buchac, there are about 60 people in this photo, these are all the survivors who were there at that time in 1945. Uh, they put up a memorial on the Federal Hill uh, for, um, they wrote 3,635 victims. There may have been more. Um, this monument disappeared shortly thereafter, probably removed by the Soviets. Instead, a uh, forest was planted over this area. Uh, the mass graves are not marked. Um, there is one single uh, monument that was put up, it's about this big, it's the size of a tombstone, but it's really impossible to find without a guide because it's deep in the forest. Uh, on the other hand, there is a very large monument there uh, for the martyrs of uh, Ukrainian uh, nationalist uh, movement. Uh, another more recent monument was put up on another hill overlooking the town, which is a monument for Stepan Bandera, who was the leader of the most radical, uh, of the radical part of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. The Jewish cemetery is generally neglected. It's often used as a garbage dump. Um, every once in a while, some people arrive and clean it up. So last June, there was a group of uh, uh, Israelis who came there, cleaned up the tombstones and mowed all the weeds and they discovered, we knew that there was a, mon a, a tombstone there for uh, Agnon's father. His name was Chachkis. Agnon is his literary name. They found his mother's grave too, uh, which we didn't know was there. And she's not buried next to the father, so I don't know why, but uh, she's some distance away from the father. Uh, if you look at this photo, however, you will see this is the, hill, the cemetery hill. In between is the city. And here is the Federal Hill. So these hills are on either side of the city. Uh, and both of them contain large unmarked mass graves. Uh, one monument was put on that cemetery hill, uh, but it was broken. Uh, last time I was there, it was impossible to approach because it's covered with these very thorny bushes. And I, I didn't have a machete, I couldn't get through. <coughs> The, the, the single largest Jewish edifice in Buchach since the 18th century was the Goise Shil, the great synagogue. Uh, that synagogue uh, was heavily damaged in the last months of the fighting, uh, but not entirely destroyed. The Soviets brought a demolition team, team in 1944, and it worked on demolishing it for about five years and apparently used the stones of the synagogue to create this elegant uh, kino theater. Uh, but there, there is no uh, cinema, but there is no uh, marking anywhere of where the synagogue actually stood. And the only uh, building that remained uh, in Buchach to remind people of uh, a once Jewish presence that was in 1939 about half of the population was the um, uh, the Beta Midrash, uh, the study house, about which Agnon writes a great deal because uh, these are the days of his youth and, and wandering, and he used to sit in there. Uh, 
But in 2001, the mayor decided that it was in the way of creating a new um, uh, shopping center and tore it down. Uh, so if, if you come nowadays to Vucic, uh, historically what you will see are the remnants of the medieval castle, the Zamek or Zamok, and to indicate that now Ukraine is engaged in another battle for its existence with Russia, uh, the flag that is on top of that is uh, the flag of the uh, Ukrainian insurgent army of UPA, which actually hasn't existed for decades, uh, but is seen as a symbol of uh, Ukrainian resistance to outside invaders. Now, if you allow me, I just want to... Uh, can, can I have another five minutes? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, I usually end up here, but, but I want to... Um, uh, point out a, a few, uh, I think, important uh, summary points um, because there's quite a number of people here I know who uh, know a fair amount about this. Uh, so after all this journey through history and through horror, uh, what did I learn from all of this? And some of this I didn't know that I would learn uh, when I started off. Uh, that first of all, that the, if you look at this genocide on the local level, you realize that the encounter uh, was intimate and not detached. That there were clear, people knew each other. Uh, both the local population which participated in that, but even also the Germans who came from the outside. Uh, so it was not anonymous. Uh, you realize that the killing was public and not private. Uh, very much unlike our sort of thinking about who knew and was it a secret and the, the, the remote extermination camps. This was not the case here. And we are talking, I, I have to stress, about half of the victims of the Holocaust were not killed in extermination camps. They were killed in such sites. The, the category of bystander, which we have sort of uh, learned to live with and in some ways like, uh, that. There were perpetrators, there were minority and they were terrible, there were victims and there were also minority. Uh, and then in between there was the mass of the population who were bystanders that when you look at it on the local level, that category quickly disappears. Uh, because what does it mean to be a bystander in a town like this? And I've always thought about it in terms of uh, the following case. If you live in a, in a four-story apartment house and your neighbors on the fourth floor um, they, they have a nice apartment. You also have a decent apartment, but you live in the first floor, less, the air is not as good, uh, and you may be a bit poor. And one day, uh, some people come and take your neighbors out of their fourth floor apartment and shoot them on the street. Now, you, you didn't want to kill them. You, you had nothing against them, and your daughter studied with their daughter math in your kitchen. Uh, but now they're gone. And if you don't move into their apartment, then someone else will. And so you do. And once you do, then you begin a process of engagement with everything else that is happening. So that when we think about what is happening on the local, in, in such a local genocide, there are only degrees of engagement. You can be a resistor, you can be a, a collaborator, you can shelter people, but you are constantly engaging with these events. There are many accounts by well, not many, I, I would say, some accounts that I have uh, from uh, elderly women uh, who describe, you know, elderly local women, Polish and Ukrainian, who describe going to school uh, in the morning and seeing corpses on the street, babies who were thrown out of balconies, the, 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 the neighbors lying uh, uh, in blood pools on the street as they go to school. This was a constant... Uh, uh, routinization and normalization of uh, mass killing. So it, it's, it's important to understand that when we see it that way, then we understand that this was not in one town, this was a major feature of the Holocaust as of many other uh, genocides, of course. I also think that one can, when you do this kind of uh, local study, you realize that you can't start at the end. Uh, I, I was and remain a great admirer of uh, uh, Jan Thomas Gross's uh, book Neighbors, which is about uh, a specific event in a, a town called Jedwabne, in which more or less the Polish half of the town killed the Jewish half. Uh, 
but he starts at the end. And to me, it became important to understand where did it all begin, and to go back and to see how did people interact with each other. And you can certainly see in this place that the brutalization of relations between people goes back at least to World War I and its immediate aftermath. It, it, it's, if, if we don't understand that, that then we start um, simplifying our understanding of relations between people. That is, the, the Germans came there and they um, uh, certainly had an agenda. Their agenda was to kill the Jews. And they would have done the best they could to accomplish that. And they may have even succeeded, they might have succeeded in killing as many. But they were very thin on the ground. And they had a great deal of cooperation, which made it much easier to do so. But it's not only that it was easier, the actual nature of the event itself had to do with the relations between the people on the ground. And people uh, experienced it that way. So that when you read Jewish testimonies, uh, those who survived, what they talk about most is not the Germans. What they talk about is their neighbors. Because the neighbors were what made a difference between life and death. You could not survive without somebody sheltering you. But often those who sheltered you also denounced you. And when you read accounts by Poles and Ukrainians about this period, they don't often talk about the Jews. They talk about the Poles and Ukrainians because much of what worried them was the conflict between each other. And so it gives you a very different understanding of the nature of this kind of local genocide, which was a large part of the genocide itself. It's also, uh, just a couple more points, the most groups, certainly the Germans, that's another story that the Germans thought of themselves as victims, of historical victims, going back to World War I. Uh, and so in a sense they were getting back at those who had victimized them and they were acting so as to prevent their repeated or prospective uh, victimization. But among the groups living there, uh, all three groups saw themselves as victims and often as victims of the other group. When they speak about the Soviet occupation, when they speak about the Germans there, they point at the other group as being those who operated, collaborated with their enemies. And often they also see the success of the other group as having been at their own cost. And it's, it's one of the most extraordinary things when, when, when you read these, these first-person accounts, the extent to which they're focused on that side that was uh, victimizing you and cooperating with your enemy. I think also that we, there, there is a kind of view, and I was also to an extent a part of it, uh, that th th all the population of, of Eastern Europe were victims of this titanic struggle between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. And they were, of course. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. Uh, but the nature of it is greatly undermined when you look from below, when you see what was actually happening and the extent to which so much of the violence was generated from within and had its own agendas that were, of course, facilitated, triggered, or put down by these larger forces from the outside, but they determined what it looked like and also how it is remembered until today. Um, and I'd say the last thing that to me was rather important is that not only that we understand from this that large parts of the Holocaust, these parts, have so much in common with other genocides. Going back to uh, the Herero in 1904 through the Armenian genocide uh, into uh, Rwanda, into Bosnia, so much of this had to do with neighbor and neighbor genocide. There were forces from the outside. They certainly helped that, uh, triggered it, but much of it was, was between people who knew each other intimately. And that, to me, ultimately made me think about our own societies, our own neighborhoods, and how much how thin the crust is that we are living on. And I always think about the moment, you know, um, you hear some 
noise on the street, maybe it's a burglary, you call the police, and the police comes and arrests you. And you suddenly realize that all the rules of the game that you had played by have changed. Everything is different. And the next moment your neighbor, whom you always said hello to on the street, may walk into your house with an axe. That is, that ultimately, so much of this with all the external forces also has to do with how thin this layer, this crust of civilization is that we exist on. So, thank you very much. Yes, I'd be, I'd be happy to. You know, I, I, I wrote about that book uh, shortly after it came out, and I was very critical of it. Um, what I was most critical of was his notion that uh, there was a unique kind of uh, eliminationist uh, anti-Semitism in Germany that you can take back to the 19th century. And um, that, to my mind, was historically not the case. In fact, most Jews in the areas that I studied uh, over the last 10, 20 years, uh, their idea was to go to Germany. Uh, they thought Germany would be much nicer and uh, their chances of integrating into society and doing well uh, economically, socially, culturally was in Germany. Uh, and in fact, even people like my grandmother spoke about the, the this, uh, the Deutsche Kulturbereich, you know, this uh, cultural sphere. Now, of course, then there were the Nazis. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that because Hitler came to power in 1933, uh, Germany was leading in that direction in this kind of deterministic uh, uh, fashion well from the 19th century. However, having done this study, um, and even as I was beginning it, the one thing that I think uh, Goldhagen was right about and didn't get enough credit for was that you need to uh, see the killing from below. And that you need to, uh, you cannot maintain, as German historians really like doing, maintain this sort of distance and describe only the logistics of killing that you cannot only write the history of the perpetrators, the perpetrators as administrators of genocide. And that when you look at it from below, when you see the dynamic between the killers and the victims and everybody around, um, the questions come up that otherwise are not asked. That doesn't work anymore in a kind of functionalist interpretation as was common at the time and that he was arguing against. Um, so from that point of view of the psychology of killing, of the intimacy of the killing, uh, and then following that, and I followed a lot of that in trials after the war, the inability of the killers ever to come to, to uh, admit uh, their guilt. Uh, their, their constant attempt to somehow say it either was not them or it was the fault of the victims, uh, and I have many such cases. Uh, that's important to understand, and I think that there, uh, he actually did something important that was not sufficiently recognized, including anti-Semitic sentiment. Uh, and you don't have to go back to the 19th century. Those people, uh, those killers, had internalized a great deal of anti-Jewish animus. Uh, and it certainly played a role along with the fact that they had absolute power over life and death, and there was a group they knew that they could do anything they wanted to. Uh, and that gives you a sense of power, and many of them a sense of pleasure. A quick question. In the beginning of your book, uh, 
there's a discussion of the Ruthenians and the Ukrainians. Yeah. And they, were they initially different, or what's, mm -hmm. what's that situation? Who's yeah. my confusion? Yeah, I, I don't want to get into the um, uh, uh, cultural uh, differences that still exist uh, today. It's a, it's a fraud a point. Look, uh, the, the, the simple issue is, is that there, there were uh, people living in that area. Uh, they were uh, called by the Austrians, Ruthenian, Ruthenians. The term came from Rus, from a medieval principality kingdom uh, that existed there. As Ukrainian nationalism begins to develop, the argument is that all those people, those living on the Austrian side and those living on the Russian side, are the same nation. Uh, whether they were or had to become that, that was a matter of politics. The original uh, Ukrainian nationalizers or Ruthenian nationalizers in the Habsburg Empire, that is on, on my side, right, on the, on the side of Galicia, uh, argued about that. Uh, and it was those, uh, those who went out were those who said that we are uh, akin to the others. The Poles, of course, argue, no, 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 the Ruthenians are not Ukrainians, and they don't use the term Ukrainians because they see that as politically dangerous because there's a lot of Ukrainians, but Ruthenians are much smaller people, and they're under our rule, and they were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and in fact, they're potentially Poles. And one can convert them gradually by civilizing them into Poles. Um, so it's, much of this is really a politics. You, you can find some such arguments also, you know, uh, among different Jewish nationalizers, right? Um, so it, there is no absolute truth here. It's more a point of your politics. <clears throat> First, I want to thank you very much for a very interesting and informative um, discussion of the topic, giving us the history. Many of us don't understand what happened there, and it would take a lot more than one hour, that I know. But um, my concern is that when Americans talk about the Holocaust, it's Auschwitz. And, what you, and I appreciate what you're bringing to light is that before Auschwitz, this was happening, and I don't even, do you know if the six million count the, all the unnamed people who were, who were killed, or was just the, the ones in concentration camps? Uh, well, in terms of the statistics, it's, you know, uh, um, there have been many attempts to calculate how many Jews were killed, and some is uh, just a demographic kind of calculation because no one was counting. Uh, people thought that the Germans were counting who they were killing. They, usually they, they, they put numbers down because they had to. Uh, but whether these numbers were correct or not, they put 3,000 people on a train, did they actually count 3,000 people? No, no one was counting. Um, the, the number is someplace between 5.4 and over 6. Um, and it's moving in recent years, I believe, toward a higher count. Um, but by and large, I mean, the numbers for the victims of Auschwitz in particular were greatly exaggerated after the war, so uh, probably about 1.1 million Jews were killed in Auschwitz. And if you add to that the other major extermination camps, Treblinka, Sobibor, Belgium, uh, you, you can get to about uh, two and a half to three million. Uh, but the rest weren't killed there. Uh, so about half a million uh, died in ghettos, uh, but the rest, uh, the rest died where they lived. Um, and even those, as I said, even those who I included in the count of the victims of the extermination camps, uh, first uh, were under German rule uh, for about a year. That's in all of Galicia, the, the majority of them. Um, and so, first of all, we have to understand that many of the Jews were killed where they live. And that's how it starts, of course. The, the, the mass killing of the Jews starts when the uh, Germans invade the Soviet Union. Uh, 
but secondly, we also have to understand that much of it was not uh, this kind of anonymous, detached killing. It was very intimate, it was often one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, it was watched by a lot of people. Um, and I should add one last thing that I, that I didn't mention in, in the talk, and I, uh, I just want to use this opportunity. Um, the, the, and that relates also to the question about gold target. In, in some of the inquiries after the war, uh, German witnesses and defendants are asked whether there was an Erschießungskommando, whether there was an execution squad. They say, no, we, we didn't need one. There were always people willing to do it. Now, there were some people who were usually charged with doing it because they were known to be key, but those witnesses say there were many other people who wanted to do it, even those who were not supposed to, like drivers and guards, uh, and they would sort of come to the killing site and wait, lurk there, they say. And if one of the shooters ran out of the ammunition, had to change his magazine, they'd spring up and say, no, 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 let me do it. And that sort of psychology of the people who are involved in the killing, it's not a question of how do you make them do it, how do you persuade them to do it, it's so hard at the beginning and then they gradually get used to it. You see none of that there. It's exactly the opposite. There's always more people wanting to do it than are needed. I was wondering if uh, you see any connection between this, uh, what you mentioned about uh, having people in your power and the pleasure uh, with the Phil Zimbardo uh, experiment with uh, having prisoners and guards and which, uh, remember it sort of got out of hand. At least that's what I've heard. Yeah. Y yeah, you know, I mean, um, there's a connection in the sense that if you give young, particularly young men, and, and, and these were males, if you give young men guns and power over others, then they're very likely to use it. Uh, now, you can say, as, uh, as Christopher Browning said, and uh, he's using Milgram's experiment more, uh, that it also has to do with peer pressure, with uh, how, uh, with authority, and I think it's true. I mean, obviously there were, uh, not everybody was as keen, right? Um, but I do find it striking how easy it is to get a group of people together, to tell them there is a targeted group. It's not anybody. There is a group, that group is targeted. You can do whatever you like to them. Uh, and you have absolute power. Um, now, to what extent does this have to do with prior prejudices about that specific group? It does. I'm sure it does. But it doesn't come up as much as I thought. In fact, when I was writing this, I was thinking about what I was writing about German soldiers in, in my early research. And uh, much less, th there was very little propaganda among these uh, security police guys. Uh, some, some German judges after the war argued that, well, there were a lot of ethnic Germans there. And it's really the ethnic Germans who were the worst because they wanted to be more German than the Germans. So they were taking their, their own group off the hook and saying, oh, it's the ethnic Germans, it's the Lithuanians and the Polish Germans, it's, it's not us. But it's not true. Th there was this mechanism too that you wanted to show that you were just as good a German as everybody else. But some of them were completely regular policemen. They were policemen before the war, they would help old ladies cross the street. They come after the war, they do the same thing. Uh, and a number, what is curious here, it's, it's also not only young men. So you have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you have uniformed police. Uh, some of the men in the 30s and 40s with two, three, four, five children at home. Um, and they initially say, no, we didn't do any killing at all. It was, we, we just rounded them up, or we just uh, created the perimeter. And gradually, you realize, no, so they went to see what it looks like. They were curious, just once or twice. Then you realize, no, actually, they were also participating in the shooting. And then they, they go back home, and they pick up their lines where they left them, until some of them are brought uh, to justice, although they usually don't go to jail. Uh, 
to uh, to say a couple of things, but to begin with, uh, one wonders really whether uh, the Hobbesian implications of your findings, and I mean, I think we anybody who immerses himself in the topic will will come to a similar sort of conclusion. Whether that can really be thought through in terms of a theory of liberal democracy. You know, I think that's a challenge that faces us because it's very easy for us to say, well, this happened out there in Galicia, and meanwhile here we are in a safe and sound America. But I mean, really, from the point of view of political philosophy and the sort of a psychology of politics, something has to be done. I mean, we have to take it another step. But uh, that's just a general point. You were saying that uh, there was no place in the future Polish national state for Jews, and I don't think you can really say that. I think that there's a Pilsudski Poland and there's a Domowski Poland, and uh, in the Pilsudski Poland there was a place for the Jews, but it did require that they Polonize themselves culturally and politically, not religiously, and, uh, and that they be citizens of Poland and not Zionists, not uh, claimants to a, a, a rival ethnicity, but still I do think that that's something that should be understood. And finally, I wanted to to uh, ask about religious Jews, because in reading your book, there really is no reference at all to Jewish religiosity. And uh, I mean, apart from organizations and things, but um, somehow this seems like a big problem that in, in, in dealing with the Holocaust, that. Uh, the, the religiosity of so many of the murdered people, you know, somehow doesn't get brought into any kind of a interpretive focus. And uh, um, so I would just like to ask you to comment on that, what you can say about the fate and the, uh, possibly the memory, let's say, of, uh, of the religious Jews of, of, of the church. Great, Bob, that's uh, three big issues. So, uh, um, f first, um, on uh, the, I, I do want to refer just in a couple of sentences to, to your first comment because I think it's a very important one. Um, the, the, the liberal or, or the implications of this for liberal thinking. Um, the, the situation that I'm describing and the times that I'm describing uh, are times in which uh, liberalism is having a very hard time, uh, is in fact hardly there. Um, and people there in the 1920s and 30s and certainly 39 to 41 and going on uh, are thinking in stark ideological, racial and ethnic terms. Um, and liberalism is very far from them. And I have no doubt that if a different discourse were available there, as there was before World War I, under the sort of more regulating apparatus of the empire, uh, it did not have to go that way. It was not an inevitable deterministic course of history. It was the wars, it was the massacres, and then it was the brutal force. Um, um, Polish rule in that area has a great deal to reckon with. Uh, the extent to which it, it uh, uh, radicalized Ukrainians, and the extent to which it marginalized the Jews, and the extent to which anti-Semitism becomes a um, uh, a, a, a major focus for Jewish communities in these towns. So, no, it's not inevitable, but it is a picture, I think, of the way it was there. That, that takes me to the, to the, so, I mean, if you want to draw any conclusions from that, I mean, the conclusions are, uh, don't, don't have uh, this kind of rabid nationalism and try to avoid these kind of massacres because they have their own dynamic. And once you begin with that, once people are exposed to this kind of violence, the youth that grows up in World War I, and, and teachers at the time speak about it, and are exposed to this 
horrifying violence over six years. They're the, the, the young men of the 20s and 30s. They are then the leaders of these um, um, uh, genocidal groups uh, under the Soviets and the Nazis. So uh, obviously um, there are alternatives to that. It's not, it doesn't have to go that way, but it did. But that takes you to the second question on Poland. So of course, yes, uh, uh, not only was Piłsudski uh, more friendly to the Jews, but the Jews admired Piłsudski way beyond what he deserved uh, because he spoke about a more inclusive uh, Poland. Um, but whatever Piłsudski had in mind, um, I would say two things here. One is that in, in the general picture after Piłsudski, after 1935, uh, the discourse becomes very different and very quickly. And it is a discourse of removing the Jews. And the, the uh, term Madagascar is not invented by Himmler, but is thrown around by Polish nationalists for reasons that I still have not been able to understand how the Poles exactly thought they would move the Jews to Madagascar in a huge navy or they would fight with the French. It was, but, but it did actually come up. Uh, let's move them over there, or they should go to Palestine. So there was a Zionist discourse that some people have suggested was pro-Jewish. It, it was nothing of the sort. It was just let them go to Palestine. It was a curse word. Uh, but specifically for places like Buchach, which is very different, um, in, 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 because Buchach is on the Kresse, and, and I'm really talking about the sort of borderlands, the Polish borderlands, where the Poles are a minority. So I spent a, a fair amount of time on the gymnasium there, uh, the, the high school, the, the enlightened high school, which is created under Habsburg in 1900. Uh, and even under Habsburg, uh, it, the leadership of the high school is Polish, and it sees itself and it sees the role of the gymnasium as, cre as, as being the incubator of Polish nationalism. And there's a fantastic moment, this is in 1900, this is still under Habsburg that the uh, director of the gymnasium makes a speech to the students and the parents. And he speaks to the, to the Polish students and to the Ukrainian students, uh, Ruthenians in, in uh, his words, and, and he says, we are all the same people. Uh, and we have to think back to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, you know, we are the Lithuanians and the Poles and the Ruthenians and we'll all be this one great nation again. There are 70 Jewish students sitting there he never once refers to them. They don't exist for him. And under Polish rule, uh, after 1921, the number of Jewish students in the gymnasium diminishes from year to year, and by the end there's none. And they certainly want to go there, which is one reason that some of these young people are actually happy when the Soviets come, because they can go to gymnasium, although they have to study then in Ukrainian, because the language changes to Ukrainian. Um, so, it's, um, in, in that area, it's, it's very stark. It's very stark. And the, much of the writing there is um, about um, creating a pole for Poles, including Ruthenians, who would be Polonized. Um, but the Jews just don't, don't appear there. It's as if they don't exist. And they are half of the population of these cities. So, it's, it's a rather extraordinary uh, issue. You, your third thing, just remind me? Religion, Religion yes. Um, now, that's very important. So, so for one thing, you know, everybody was religious. I was even asking some uh, old-timers. They said, well, my family was not religious. Obviously, I mean, we, we kept kosher, and my mother had <laughs> candles on Friday, and, but, but we were not really religious. So, and everyone was religious. Unless you were really a dyed-in-the-wool communist, and there were about 20 of them. Um, but everybody else was. Uh, but there were different uh, degrees. Buchach is an interesting case, uh, because right next to Buchach is the town of Chotkov. And Chotkov, where later the, the Sicherheitspolizei has its Alfenstelle, has its outpost, it was a Hasidic town. Uh, and there's a whole lot about the Hasidism of Chotkov. There were some famous rabbis from there, and so forth. Uh, Buchac was not. Uh, the, the Hasidim were a very small minority, and it saw itself as a town of uh, misnagdim, of the sort of preservers of the old style, and of enlightened uh, Jews, of masculine. Uh, 
Um, what role religion plays in the events is, is very hard to say. I mean, one, one thing that is, I didn't talk about it here, but I do talk about it in the book. Um, the people who become the uh, initial heads of the Jewish council are the initial head, are the former heads of the community. A number of them are Orthodox Jews, truly Orthodox Jews. Um, and some are leaders of Zionist parties. Uh, and some are industrialists who are also Orthodox. Um, some cannot continue cooperating with the Germans, try to flee or step down, and most of them are killed. And the last one uh, is and is described as a former Hasid, uh, who before the Germans came had payers and wore a kaftan, and then he shaved it all, and he did the Germans' bidding. He even ran a brothel for them. Um, so what did religion play there? I, I, I could not find any particular um, logic in that. The only thing I can say is that some of the young communists went off to be resistors. But even there, uh, one should not idealize that. Uh, there were characters, quite a number of young men, they were not religious in the sense that I meant. So they ate kosher, but they were not religious. Um, who were members of the Jewish police because they wanted to survive and because they also had parents that they thought they could protect, or young siblings. And then, when the Jewish police is dismantled, or really they come to kill them, uh, they flee to the forest and they become resistors. Uh, and if you talk with them, you'll hear one side of the story. Uh, obviously the side of them being in the resistance. If you look at documents, as I did for one of them, uh, when he was interrogated about a German policeman and asked how he knew him, he said, well, of course, I mean, I was in the Jewish police, and that's why, how I got to know this uh, Peter Paul, this Shandan. Um, so it's actually very hard to pin down what role religion plays there. I, I have not been convinced that it's, there's any logic to it. Uh, in, the, in the aftermath, I would say that for Butchac, it's like for any other place, there were people who discovered religion because of genocide, and there were people who discarded religion because of genocide. And, um, you know, so I don't, I don't know which one is right. We, we only have time for one more question, um, a short question from one of our students because Professor Bartok has another engagement. Thank you so much. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, I'm just struggling to comprehend the, the such closely intimate, the relational aspect of these killings that are, that are taking place. And, um, how could you know uh, your neighbor that, that you've dealt with for, for you know, years and you know their kids and you, you go, you, your children play together with your, with your children and, and you mentioned in the German case where uh, the, 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 uh, the Jewish would have, would take care of their kids while they went to a ball or something and then yet possess that capacity to just wipe that aside and say, you know, you're, you're, you're dead, right? Uh, I'm just struggling to comprehend that, and, and also wondering what were the role of women in, in this picture? Did they stop that, or did they was there break, did they uh, put a break to any of that, or did they try to say that this is not right of any kind? Thank you. Well, you know that's a, that's maybe the most important question. I I I don't I don't have a simple answer to this. Um, the the most important thing is first of all to recognize that and. And people who talk about it um, are appalled precisely by that. They keep going back to it. Now, some of my Ukrainian and Polish uh, interviewees uh, would say we, uh, Poles and Ukrainians, uh, did all we could to shelter the Jews. We felt sorry for our. Uh, uh, these were girls that we went to school together with, um, and, it, and, and I'm sure that in many cases it's true, um, but it's in many cases not true. Uh, and um, 
there's, there's a line that a number of Ukrainian and, and Polish uh, witnesses say, well, what we don't understand is why did they go like that to be killed? Why did they not rise up? Why did they not fight back? There were so many of them being led and there were just a couple of armed Germans. And what they forget, and it's really interesting whether they forget or, is that they were surrounded by Ukrainian militia. And it disappears from memory. Uh, and they say, well, they must have known that this was their destiny. Right? They were going almost willingly to their death. Um, so th part of it is a kind of, um, it, it's hard to, to explain. But there's another aspect to it which I think is very important. And I think that you see in other genocides as well. Uh, the Germans are actually very brutal in the killings. There's, there's, there's many cases of brutality. It's not at all just the shooting. It's, I, I don't want to go into the details. Um, but I think that um, the gratuitous violence that uh, happens within these, among these neighbors, in some ways has to do precisely with the intimacy. Because uh, there is a need to dehumanize your neighbors, people you've known for all your life. And one way of doing it is to do to them things that are absolutely extraordinary. It's to treat them in a way that would make them not look human anymore. Uh, and it, in some ways, this is something that I was thinking about when I started because there, there are so many accounts of that happening in Rwanda and Bosnia, precisely this of uh, uh, rapes of, of, of daughters of your neighbors, and it, things that are impossible to, to understand, and yet they seem to happen precisely because of the intimacy. Um, what effect that has in, in, in the long run, I think it does have a... Um, a brutalizing effect on an entire society that is very hard then to heal. Um, but, but it is part of the reality of this kind of genocide, and I think that our attempts, including my own, you know, when I was criticizing uh, Goldhag and I said what was unique about the Holocaust was the extermination camps, because those didn't, were not, didn't exist before, didn't exist after. That's the one thing that has not been repeated. Uh, and that's true. But what about all the, all the rest of it? And, and all the rest of it is, uh, in some ways, um, more human in the sense that it's happened so much, so often before and after, and keeps happening. And we try to distance ourselves from that by thinking of this sort of clean, organized, uh, neat kind of genocide. Thank you.